Great. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us this morning for our first of many Heritage Escrow Monthly Guest Speaker Series. Um, so we are here. These your, Our faces here are your Heritage Escrow Business Development Team. So we are excited to be here today and appreciate you guys coming. And we look forward to every second Thursday of the month, we will be providing a special guest speaker. And um, we will go ahead and really our goal is to create some value for you and your business. Uh, we appreciate your attendance and we absolutely respect your time. So we're going to get right on in and get started. So our topic today is the 1031 exchange. We're going to talk about the ins and outs processing and if there's any COVID updates, Anthony's going to update us on that as well. Here's a couple of housekeeping items. One, in an effort to reduce the background noise, all of our attendees, you will be muted throughout the webinar. So if you have any questions, please utilize that chat. It's at the bottom of your screen. Ask any questions you want and throughout the, throughout the uh, webinar, we'll make sure to get those answers for you. Also, number three, be sure to stay tuned. Don't leave us too soon because we'll have a raffle prize to give away to, to one of you today. All right, so here's our introductions. I am Tamara Armstrong, and I'm here at the uh, Heritage Escrow Temecula brand. I work with two amazing escrow officers with a uh, very, uh, just a lot of experience, one of which is uh, Carol Hankey. She's been in the business for 35 years. And um, also Chanel Jones, been in for 25 years, and I absolutely love our team, so we have a great time here. And next is Marissa. Marissa tours out of our Carlsbad office. Good morning, Marissa. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Thank you for taking time out of your day for this webinar. Um, I am really excited for this new webinar series that we have going on. Today, we have Anthony, who we've done previous presentations with before pre-COVID in real life. Um, so this one's slightly different, but we're excited to be presenting the webinar today. So you're going to be learning a lot from Anthony. Um, but I'm the sales rep in the Carlsbad Heritage Escrow Branch. We are centrally located off Palomar Airport Road. And I have the pleasure of representing three incredible escrow officers. I'm in my branch right now as we speak. Um, I have uh, Holly Burt as my branch manager. I have Jill Severns and Anella Mirasher Lindo. So those are your escrow officers in Carlsbad. I also want to highlight our Escondido branch as well off of Valley Parkway. We have Alicia Bagby and we have Kelly Panero. So again, thank you so much everyone for being here. I will kind of chime in throughout to answer um, some of the questions that you guys have throughout the webinar. So again, make sure to utilize that Q&A box and you can use the uh, chat box as well. So thank you everyone. Awesome, and Jara Payne. Jara is from our Rancho Santa Fe office. Good morning, Jara. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's so nice to be here. I'm so excited about this webinar series um, for everybody. All my agents are really looking forward to it. So um, I am the sales rep for the Rancho Santa Fe branch and my escrow officers here um, Stephanie Clark's the branch manager and she opened this office over 20, about 25 years ago. Um, and Kristen Bramble, who has been here almost as long. So um, they are rock stars. So awesome. lucky to have them. <laughs> Great, thank you. Sharla Dabney, she's from our Balboa Park office with Ocean Views, lucky. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome. Thank you guys so much joining us today. My name is Sharla and I represent our Balboa Park branch where we have some amazing escrow officers, our branch manager, uh, Donna Hamilton. We also have our bulk sale escrow officer, mm -hmm. Debbie Howe. I'd also like to highlight our Irvine branch where we have escrow officer and branch manager, Janet Tilbury, Holly Jizak, and mm -hmm. Tara Vell. Thank awesome. you guys so much. Thank you guys. Thank you, ladies. Okay, so let's get started. I'd love to introduce to you our guest, Anthony Alosi, Alo and he is with First American, uh, and he's been with First American, American, excuse me, Exchange for 25 years. Four of those years, he started actually in escrow, so he's just a wealth of knowledge for us. Anthony, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. Great. Good morning, Tamara. Thank you for the introduction, and I'm happy to be here and happy to participate as well, too. 
Um, hopefully everyone can hear me, yes? Okay, good. Okay, so let's get the bad news out of the way first, right? Bad news is there's no more COVID relief, unfortunately, right? We had some relief earlier this year. Uh, the service issued uh, some, some relief for certain exchangers that were in an active transaction, um, but it's long since expired. So there's, and, and there's really nothing on the horizon that we can uh, forecast that is gonna be coming out anytime soon for relief. So uh, the good news is people are super active um, in 1031 exchanges. And in August, we actually had a record setting month for uh, the number of new transactions that we saw for that month, um, more than I'd seen in the last four years, believe it or not. So nobody out there in the real estate world seems to be terribly concerned with COVID, uh, which is great. Um, we're seeing transactions all over the place, different sectors. Um, so it's, again, I don't wanna say business as usual, but for us, it pretty much is. Um, you see me here, I'm back in my office, but most of my team is working remotely and we're working remotely just fine. Um, for an exchange, right, you don't need to have any documents notarized. We can work with DocuSign, electronic signatures. So for us, the transition to you know, working out of our homes has been very, very simple. Uh, and again, for us, like I said, it's, it's really been business as usual. So um, I, again, just thank you, uh, Heritage Escrow, for allowing me to be part of this group here. And I, I'm going to spend the next you know, 45 minutes or so to an hour to talk about the exchange process and how it works and why um, you should know about it if you don't already, right? It's just another um, tool in your tool belt to help you out there uh, be you know, an expert in your field. And for real estate agents, it's a very, very easy sell. And I tell them all the time, Remember with a 1031 transaction, there are always two transactions uh, that you can in essence work both sides of the properties being sold and ultimately the properties being acquired. So um, bear with me, I've done a lot of Zoom calls, um, but I'm much better in person because I like to be interactive and call on people and answer questions as they come up. Um, so I'm gonna be, uh, I'll, I'll pause every few minutes and ask if we have any questions and someone in the, the, that can tell me that have things in the chat. You know, generally speaking, I cover the majority of the nuts and bolts in my presentation. So if you have specific questions, we can definitely talk about those as well, too. Um, so let's dive right in. I usually ask for a show of hands who's done one before, so I can't really do that. But um, I'm, I'm assuming a majority of people have at least been involved in some way, shape or form with the 1031. They've been around literally almost 100 years. Uh, the first one, I think, was done in 1929. So we are coming up on our you know 100 year anniversary. Um, you know, people ask me about what's the what the future looks like for 1031 transactions. There's always talk about, you know, D.C., Washington, uh, simplifying the tax code, um, doing away with 1031 exchanges, putting a limit on it. Um, and I, as Tamara said, I've been doing this for almost 25 years now. And literally since day one that I got into the business, there has been somebody out there, you know, trying to say, hey, we're doing away with exchanges, right? They're going away. We're going to put a cap on it. We're going to put a limit on it. We're going to do something that's going to, you know, alter the business of, of, of 1031 transactions. And guess what? We're still here. And I don't see anything changing for that. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think the real estate lobby in Washington, D.C. is too strong. And I think if people see this uh, specific provision go away within the tax code, um, this whole segment of the market just totally dries up. And, and they don't want to see that. So it's too important. It, it's too, there's too much activity and it gives people a reason to buy and sell property. And that's really what the goal for an exchange is. So just in a quick short definition, um, a 1031 is a tax deferral program. You know, it, it's a, it's allows an investor, someone who owns investment real estate to defer the payment of capital gains tax. And I always tell people, remember in an exchange, you are exchanging property. You have to sell something and you have to buy something in order for it to qualify for an exchange. You're selling your investment that you currently own. Your goal is to buy another investment that you know generally is gonna be better than the one you have. And that's why most people look at 1031 transactions. They're either gonna get into a better performing property or they're gonna diversify by selling one and buying two or three, or they're con consolidate. Those are the two really best strategies we see for 1031 transactions. Consolidating, saying, I'm going to take a couple of small rental properties and I'm going to go buy a bigger rental property or a bigger investment, or I'm going to get into an apartment building or something like that. So there's a lot of advantages for 1031 exchange, but really the biggest advantages is the exchanger is trying to better their position. I mean, I tell people, look, sure, there's a tax advantage for them. It's a way for them to defer the payment of capital gains tax, but 
generally that's not why people look at 1031. They look at the current investment they're holding and go, how can I yield more out of this, out of this investment? And that means getting to a property that has better cash flow, that's got better upside, that's going to you know, uh, maximize their, their leverage and their net worth. So that's really where people start looking at the exchange process. The, the bright side for them is that they learn about the exchange and the, they can defer payment of capital gains tax. That's a little kind of you know, added, added for them that helps them guide them through that transaction. But 1031 is federal. So that we know that transaction can be done all over the US. It's not specific to California and moving in and out of different states, totally okay. Um, and moving in and out of different property types, totally okay. So we will we'll cover that as well too. Um, but basically, that's kind of the uh, you know the <clears throat> the basic definition of an exchange. You've got to exchange a like kind piece of property for another like kind piece of property. We'll talk about what like kind means because it is a very broad definition. Do we have any questions so far? We do have one. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Marissa. I was going to say we do have one question, um, and you may be jumping into this, but. Um, we want to discuss the process of how to get started with doing a 1031 exchange. Yeah. Oh, we'll definitely cover that for sure. Yeah. You bet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So here's some of the reasons why people do an exchange, as I just mentioned. I mean, you know, the old adage for 1031 is a defer, 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 then die. Right. I mean, at your death, really, well, you, you get the, the added benefit of what we call a stepped up basis. And when we look at 1031 transactions, it's kind of twofold, right? people get an immediate benefit today where they get to defer the payment of capital gains tax. And as you see on my slide here, <clears throat> these are the limits for 1031, uh, for, I'm sorry, for capital gain. The limit for federal can be up to 20%. State of California tax is 12.3. We still have the Obamacare tax or the Affordable Care Act tax at 3.8. That depends on the investor's um, individual uh, income. And we also have a depreciation component for uh, recapture, what we're, we're referred to as recapture. So for your typical California investor, um, they're going to meet most of these thre thresholds for income. So California investor is looking to pay anywhere between 35 and 38% capital gains tax on the sale of their investment. Big, big number, right? Uh, we saw capital gains tax get um, increased in 2013. So we've been working under these rates here for the last six or seven years. And that's why we've seen an, a huge increase or uptick in the number of transactions that are 1031 related since 2013. Um, people are looking at their property values now. They've all gone up. You know, in some counties, some places, they've exceeded the two point, uh, the 2007 or 2.8, 2008 level that they had with the real estate value. So gain is back and people have a tremendous amount of tax due on the sale of their property. So they are now constantly looking for 1031 transactions to um, alleviate this, the, the payment of the tax. So that's, you know, benefit number one is today I get to defer the payment of this 35, 38% capital gains tax. The other benefit comes to me, really comes to my family or my heirs when I pass. Because what happens with 1031 exchange is once you die, and that's why I have my little slide here. It says this little, I, I guess you can't see it, but there, it says expire in 2040. There's a skull and crossbone. For some reason, I didn't pick it up in my, in my, uh, in the way it translated over. But anyway, at, in 2040, when you pass, your heirs in essence receive a stepped up basis in the replacement property. So they get it at, at current market value. So let's say in 2010, you bought your first investment. You paid $500,000 for it. In 2017, you did your first exchange. You bought two other properties and you deferred the gain. In 2025, you did another exchange and you bought two more properties. Now in 2040, let's say you own five properties and they're worth four million dollars so you started with one property of five hundred thousand you've now parlayed in that into five properties and it's worth four million bucks once you pass your heirs receive the properties at a new value or a new basis the basis gets stepped up to the current market value of the day of your death in essence they receive the five properties at four million dollars there's zero gain for them the gain gets relieved they can liquidate those properties and sell them and put four million bucks in their pocket and walk away, okay? So the beauty of 1031, again, sadly, the investor doesn't always see the true benefit of it because the true benefit comes when they pass, right? They get a stepped up basis or their heirs do, the heirs get the property tax-free, well, maybe rephrase that, capital gains tax-free. They generally get a tax-free as well too because the inheritance tax now is $10 million per person. So they can receive up to $20 million of real estate 
without paying any tax. And that really is the true benefit of the exchange process. Um, so I'll just give you guys a minute to maybe ask a question on this, because this is really where the true benefit of the exchange process gets overlooked. They get the immediate benefit today, but their heirs also get the stepped up basis when they pass. And that really uh, relieves them of the capital gain component. So the process for 1031 is always exchange. You're always exchanging. When you decide to sell something is when Uncle Sam's gonna say, okay, time to pay your capital gains tax. So continue to exchange and you can continue to defer the capital gains tax indefinitely. Okay, we do have a question, or we do have actually a couple questions. One of them being, can you keep the tax deferral if you occupy the property after? Um, well, the answer, simple answer to that is no, right? I mean, if you decide to occupy the property thereafter, so let's say you bought, it's a good question. Let's say you bought a property um, as investment, and then after four or five years, decide, oh, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and move into that property. And then you live there for the next five or six years. At the end of the six years, now it's your personal residence, right? You can take your primary residence exclusion, the 250 or 500,000 if you're married, but that's it, right? With your personal residence, you have a, a limit on capital gains tax. You can defer only up to 500,000 for a married couple. For 1031 transactions, there's no limit on the amount of gain you can defer. So once you move in, you've now eliminated the ability to exchange out of that property again. But, well, unless you move in, live there, and then rent it back out again for another few years, then you could do an exchange back out of that. But if you're currently living in the property, then no, you can't exchange out of that. Okay, next question. Can an investor exchange a primary into an investment or vice versa? Well, no, you can't, right? So with your primary residence, again, you get an exclusion from capital gains tax. You can literally exclude $250,000, $500,000, depending on your marital status. And exclusion means just that. You can put the two hundred fifty dollars or $500,000 in your pocket. There's no requirement to reinvest the money. With 1031 exchange, it is, as I said before, an exchange, which says you have to sell the investment that you currently have and buy another investment that you're looking to purchase. So moving in and out of personal residence into investment, Number one, you don't need to generally because you get the exclusion. But if you have, let's say you have a property that you bought um, and you have more than $500,000 of gain, you can't exchange the balance of that property because you want to defer all the gain. If you've lived there for the last 10 years and it's only been your personal residence, no, then you can't exchange it into something else. Does that help? Okay. Yeah. Or I'm assuming yes. Okay, I can't see this news, which is so yeah. difficult to see. Um, yeah. Next question. Can I combine residential rental and vacant in a 1031? Um, well, uh, meaning like you're selling the residential rental and the vacant land, you're selling two properties? Or can you sell residential I and buy vacant land? I do not know. The question yeah. just says, can I combine rental and vacant? We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll hit on that in just a minute uh, because we're going to talk about property type. Yeah. So any okay. questions related to the, the, the capital gains deferral or the stepped up basis? Because I, I always like to hone in on this slide because it's important people realize that a 1031 exchange generally is not really like a one and done transaction. You have to think kind of long-term, like I, if I'm gonna be in the real estate world, the real estate business as a real estate you know, investor, I have to think about always exchanging. Sure, you can get a, an immediate benefit today. You can defer your capital gains tax today, but what happens five years and 10 years and 20 years from now, right? In order to keep deferring, you got to keep exchanging. Just, I just want to make sure that everyone understands that point. Okay, so here's the other thing too, when I do my presentations, I always tell people, if you remember anything about today, remember this slide, because this slide defines the entire process in eight short words or 10 short words. If you want to be fully tax deferred in a 1031, you need to exchange equal or greater value equal or greater equity to what you're selling. That's it. And I always tell people, don't overcomplicate the exchange process. It's not complicated. You are exchanging value and equity, okay? Value, what are you selling the property for? I'm selling it for a million bucks. Great, you gotta buy a million dollars or more. Doesn't matter what you paid for it. Doesn't matter how much you put down. Doesn't matter how much depreciation you have. Doesn't matter how much you put into it in tenant improvements. None of that matters for 1031 purposes. That's a separate conversation you have with your CPA if you don't do an exchange, because then you have to determine basis or cost basis in the property. 
for 1031 transactions, what are you selling it for? I sold it for a million dollars. Great. I know I need to buy a million dollars or more. But can you, you know, hone in on that number a little bit more? Sure. If you want to exclude out commissions and some closing costs, you can do that. So maybe you have $50,000 worth of selling expense, escrow fees, title fees, real estate commissions. Okay. Now you got to buy 950 or more. But the value one is very easy to see. It's what am I selling the property for? The next component is equity. And that's also very easy to see. It's what did I net for my escrow? I netted $650,000. I paid off my debt and I paid off all my expenses. What am I left with? So I've got a million dollar sale and I've got $650,000 of equity. Those are my two minimum requirements into the new property. I've got to buy something for a million dollars or more. And I got to put at least 650 down in equity if I want to be fully tax deferred. So I'll, again, I'll let that sink in for a minute. So people understand, it doesn't matter how much debt you have. It doesn't how, matter how much, again, you originally paid for the property, what your initial down payment was. None of that matters for an exchange. That all will matter if you don't do an exchange. And then you have a conversation with your tax person about calculating gain, calculating your tax due, all that kind of stuff. But for an exchange, because we're not you know, qualified CPAs, um, they came up with this napkin test that says, okay, here's the easy strategy for, for 1031 transactions. Here's how you need to be fully tax deferred. And we get this a lot. People go, okay, well, I'm selling the property for a million bucks and I'm, I'm netting 650, but I put 150 down when I first bought that property. I want to take that out as my original investment. Can't, can't do it. Whatever you exclude is going to be taxable to you right? As long as you exchange the same. So, and people get a little upset because they go, well, wait a minute. When I first brought the property, that $150,000 was in essence money I'd already paid tax on, right? Post-tax dollars I used to buy my first investment. Now, if I don't exchange again, your Uncle Sam's going to tax me again. Yes, he is. So again, it's important for people to realize if you want to be fully tax deferred, you cannot exclude anything. If someone goes, well, I want to take $150,000 out because I have some losses that I can uh, offset. Okay, it's still considered boot. And whether or not you're going to pay tax on that money will be up to you and your CPA to determine. Okay, so as long as you exchange for value and equity of what you're selling, you're fine to do that. Can you sell more than one and buy one bigger property? Sure. Can you sell one and buy, buy multiple properties? Absolutely. So if I sold a million dollar property, I could buy four $250,000 properties. Yeah, no problem. It's combined value and combined equity on the replacement property, same thing. Any questions on that? I do have a couple of questions that came in. We'll wait to see if some come in specifically on that, um, but that did come across for um, people passing away. Okay. One of them is if my parents gave me an investment property with a lot of capital gains, and they pass away, do the capital gains get wiped out or no, because I now own it? Well, okay. Um, what, what, yeah, see, I, I'd have to, what, when they got the property, did they give it to him uh, upon his their death? Did he inherit the property? Or did they deed it to him when they were still alive? Okay, let us know in the yeah. question in the chat box. Oh, no, deed, no, deed when still okay. alive. Yeah, so I mean, that's a that's a really good question. I don't have an answer for you on that, unfortunately. Sorry, because here's the thing. I mean, how effectively did they deed? Yeah, exactly. I'm laughing. At how effectively did they deed a property to you um, without any taxable event occurring? Right. I mean, a lot of people go, "Well, I'm going to gift this property to my kids." Okay, well, I think there's a limit on how much you can gift. So I'm not sure exactly how that works. I don't know the answer to that question. That would be really a specific question for a CPA. Okay, one more yeah. about that same topic. Um, what if someone were to pass after five years, for example, is there something magical about the year 2040 or is that just an example? Oh no, that was just an example. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So as we discussed a minute ago, what, how, do you, how do you become fully tax deferred in an exchange? Okay, equal or greater value, equal or greater equity. If you don't do that, then you have what we call boot. And boot is basically the difference between what you sell and what you buy. And boot doesn't destroy the exchange at all. Many, many, many people take boot out of the transaction. Totally fine, perfectly acceptable. The only thing they need to realize is 
It's a partial exchange. You're going to pay tax on it. That's it. No problem. You sell a million dollar property and you go, hey, I want to take $150,000 of equity. I want to put it on my bank account. Totally fine. No problem whatsoever. Um, California will take the withholding, right? So escrow will take the three and a third. And then you will settle up with Uncle Sam on, on a federal level when you, when you do your uh, uh, 2020 return or whatever, you, whatever year you sell the property in. So taking boot out is totally fine. It just becomes taxable. The only thing with boot I tell people is once you take more boot than you have gain in the property, then, then doing an exchange doesn't help you. And let me, let me explain that. Okay, I have a million dollar property and let's say I bought it for $600,000 and all things being equal, my gain is 400,000. I'm not taking into account depreciation or improvements, anything like that. But I, I bought it for 600, it's now worth a million dollars. Okay, so I have $400,000 of gain in that property. Let's say I wanted to buy a property only for 500,000 bucks. I only want to do an exchange for 500,000. So in that transaction, I went from a million relinquished property, the one I sold, to $500,000 replacement property. The boot amount is $500,000, okay? My gain is only $400,000. I, I, there's no benefit for me doing a 1031, zero, because I have more boot than I have gain. So if I trade down too much by too small of a property, I've, I've defeated the purpose of, of 1031 and I'm not gonna get any benefit whatsoever. So again, I want to make sure people understand that you can take boot out, no problem, but you can't take out more boot than you have to have actual gain in the property. So a lot of people do. I mean, again, they're, you know, especially today, we get a lot of these uh, of our customers that say, you know, they're selling something for a million seven uh, and they've got maybe four, five, six hundred thousand dollars of gain. Well, they don't want to reinvest the whole amount. They have no idea what the next six days look, let alone the next six years. So they're really concerned about buying too much real estate and over encumbering themselves or putting themselves in a position where they don't know what the future looks like. Okay, well, you need to make sure that you understand if you only replace a million dollars every million seven, that's $700,000 of boot. If you don't have at least that much gain in the property that you're selling, don't do an exchange. Just cash out and, and, and pay your tax and move on. So again, people take boot out all the time, smaller amounts. Right? I want 50,000, I want 100,000, I want 200, okay, no problem. But when you start taking out half a million, a million dollars of boot, then you start looking at, okay, well, how much gain do you have? Because you have, if you don't have enough gain, then don't do an exchange. Now, if someone sold the property for a million seven and they bought it 40 years ago for $50,000, okay, then the 100% of that transaction is gain, 100% of it. So if they want to take out 500,000 or a million, they're still going to get some relief. So you know, again, I try to avoid having conversations with the taxpayer about taxable issues because I'm not a CPA. But I, you know, I've, I've been doing 1031s for 25 years, so I have a very good understanding of them. So I, I have a very like high level conversation with a client about where their position is and what their taxable gain would be or where their cost base of the property was. But, you know, as a real estate person, I would always recommend to not do that. And I would generally tell certain people back to their CPA. Uh, to help them guide, navigate through that, that those, those waters as well. Uh, questions on that, Marissa? I do have one that um, I'll bring up to you. Um, if you are selling one property and buying multiple properties, does it have to be done at the same time or would this be a series of separate exchanges? Well, yeah, if you're selling one and buying multiple properties, it has to be done within the same 180 day time frame of the exchange. It's one exchange. And we're going to get to the time frames here in just one minute. Okay. But yes, it, uh, yeah, everything is triggered by the sale of the relinquished property. That'll trigger the exchange. So if you're buying more than one replacement property, you'll have to have them all acquired within 180 days. Yeah. Okay. So I have. Um, boot? Oh. Oh, okay. yes. No, no direct boot questions. Okay. I got one more quick slide on boot and uh, there are two types of boot. Well, really three types. Um, cash boot is basically, again, easy. It's what I have left over. So back to my original example, I sold the property for a million. I netted 650 in my exchange. I used all but $600,000 of it for the replacement property. And I have 50,000 left over, that's cash boot. Okay, I'll pay tax on the cash, uh, I'm on, on the 50,000, no problem. And if the money's sitting with us and now your exchange is done, 
instead of escrow doing the withholding for the three and a third, we do the withholding for the three and a third. Mortgage boot's a little bit different because mortgage boot is harder to see. But let's say back to my example, I sold for a million, okay? I paid off my loan for 350 and I netted my 650, okay? So now what I'm doing is I'm buying a property for 900,000, okay? I'm gonna buy something a little bit less, and I, but I'm gonna use all my 650. So instead of getting a loan for 350, I'm only getting a loan for 250. That's mortgage boot, okay? I, so remember, I didn't trade up or equal in value. I went from a million to 900,000. There's my $100,000 of boot. The boot is just represented in what they call mortgage boot because I have less of a loan. Okay. The last one is seller financing. And I just talked to someone actually that I think was working with Carol, Carol Hinkey the other day about seller financing. Uh, seller financing becoming a little bit more popular these days again. Um, not a great um, pairing with 1031 transactions. If you're the seller of a property and need to offer your buyer financing, that limits you. Right, so if you sold a million dollar property, but the buyer needs to, you to carry five hundred thousand, that's five hundred thousand less than your exchange. That five hundred thousand dollars that is in the form of a promissory note that you're going to get payments on, you're going to pay tax on that as you receive those principal payments. So if there's a way to avoid seller financing with an exchange, I always recommend trying to do that because you're now going to exclude that amount from your ten thirty one. Okay, any questions on that? There may be a question on seller financing. It, it does come up uh, quite a bit now. We're seeing many more transactions that are seller financed. Yeah. I do have a quick boot question. So $100,000 boot, you would pay capital gains on 100,000. Yeah, exactly, right. The difference between, if you, if you sold for a million and bought for 900, the $100,000 difference, it doesn't, so it doesn't necessarily have to be in the form of cash, right? you could pay the boot when you do your tax return too. Meaning the, the difference was the mortgage boot, right? The, the, the debt relief boot. Yes, so in answer to your question, yeah. Okay, so property requirements for an exchange. Okay, again, remember the slide I said, if you remember anything, remember that slide, equal or greater value, equal or greater equity. This is number two on the list, the property requirement. And again, I tell people in the world of 1031 exchanges, it always comes down to a single word. One word defines your exchange and that is intent. The intent has to be to hold the property for investment or use it in a trader business. That's how you define a 1031 property. Now, again, that's a lot of kind of legal jargon. What does that mean for me? How, does that, how do I qualify for an exchange? Well, in residential transactions, it's fairly easy to see. It's generally rental property. I say that in the next breath, I would say, it doesn't have to produce income for it to qualify for an exchange, does not. So, so it gets a little murky sometimes, but generally speaking on residential transactions, rental property, right? People that, that's investment, that's how you define an investment. Guys that are flipping property, real estate investors that are flipping, buying, fixing up, putting right back on the market, that is not held for investment. Those are properties that the IRS or the franchise tax board would, would identify as held for sale, okay? You have no intent to hold it for investment. You're simply buying the property with intent to sell it. You're going to fix it up and sell it right away. Those guys that are doing those types of transactions are not doing 1031. And I always give the example. Um, and if you've seen me do my presentation before, you've heard it. But it's very clear. And I'd like to define it this way. Let's say a guy buys a piece of property and he, it's a fixer upper. Let's say it's a total teardown. He's got it down to the studs. Okay. And it takes him 26 months to do his rehab. And I use 26 months because it's over two years. Because for 1031 purposes, there's no holding period requirement that says, hey, once I've held the property for this many days, weeks, months, or years, I'm in the clear. It's not about the timing. It's about your intent. Guy buys a property, fixes it up, 26 months. He buys it for 500,000. And now he's got it on the market for a, a million five. And he makes a million bucks. Can you do an exchange? You know, it, it, as soon as he's done, he's got a for sale sign on the front yard. And he's got the marketing the property to sell. Can he exchange? I say he'd have a tough time explaining to an auditor how he bought that property with intent to sell. Uh, I'm sorry, with intent to hold for investment. Well, he held it for two years, right? But the two year period, he was rehabbing it. And then as soon as he was done rehabbing it, he marketed it for sale. Where's the investment component? A different guy buys a piece of property. Let's say he buys a property, not a fixer upper. He puts new carpet, new paint, some new grass out in the front. Month two, he's got a for rent sign on the front yard. 
a guy comes in and signs a two-year lease, okay? Six months after that, the neighbor comes to this owner and says, hey, Joe, I want to buy your property from you because I want to, you know, I want to have some family closer to me. I'm going to move him down here in a year or so. Can he do an exchange? It's only been six months. Can he exchange? And I say, yeah, you bet, for sure. Why? He clearly had intent to hold the property for investment. He didn't market it. He got an, a, a, a non-solicited offer, an unsolicited offer. He had a tenant in the property. The tenant had signed a long-term lease. So we clearly defined his intent more so than the guy that was doing the flip. So remember, it's never about time. It's always about intent. So hopefully that helps. Um, a couple of properties that don't qualify for an exchange. Well, okay, my, my, my slide was covered. So property held for sale, the guys that are flipping, are, again, are not doing exchanges. Your uh, properties that are really true vacation home or second home, those are not going to qualify either. So again, if I have a property that I own in Mammoth and I only use it for my own personal use, that is not, that's a true sec vacation home. It doesn't work for 1031 purposes. Now, if I have a property in Mammoth and I have it with a management company or I have it with VRBO or Airbnb or one of these vacation rental sites and I use it for a very limited amount of time every year, and the rest of the time it's available, then yeah, then I could do that. I mean, the rule of thumb for personal use, I always tell people it's 14 days or less, or it's 10% of the total amount of time that you rented it out, okay? So I, I just tell people very, very limited personal use. You know, two or three weeks out of the year, you should be okay. If you're using it for six months here and six months there, I'd say don't use that for 1031 purposes. Second home vacation, I'm kind of in that same category. Um, also, again, we just talked properties that are held for sale, don't so qualify. And then you can't do an exchange on anything other than real estate now. Stocks, bonds, um, notes, interest in a partnership, personal property, that's all not 1031 uh, uh, eligible anymore. The last thing we saw was uh, that uh, we used to be able to do 1031 exchanges on some personal property. And back in the day, I would do it on um, aircraft, like large pieces of equipment. I did it on a lot of collectible stuff. I did it on some exotic cars, some coins, um, some actual cool stuff, but now all, all that's gone away. It's now real estate for real estate. And again, the real estate I sell is held for investment. The real estate I buy has to be held for investment. So someone had asked the question before about, can I move into the property or live there? And I say, sure. I would tell people most CPAs kind of fall on this two year date. So sell your investment. And let's say I'm, I know I'm going to retire in three years and I want to live in Denver, Colorado. I buy my investment property in Denver. It's a single family. I rent it out for the first few years. And then I move into, their, into, the, into the property after the end of three years. Fine. No problem. Especially if I lived in Denver for the rest of my life, totally fine. So that's no problem. Um, questions on that? We do have a similar question to what you just mentioned. If you sell a rental property, then 1031 that property for rental for two to three years, then move into that property. It becomes my primary residence. If you go to sell in 10 years, you get the 500,000 exclusion, right? No capital gains. Yes, you do, okay. yeah. The, and the only little caveat to that is, let's say that you, if you have more than $500,000 of gain in that property, then you're gonna pay the tax on it. That's the only downside to it. Because remember, there's a cap on your primary residence where there's no cap on 1031. But yes, and that's what some people do. The only little uh, snafu on that is if they decide to sell the property before the end of the fifth year, they don't get any of the exemptions. So remember, if you're going to convert, there's a minimum of five years holding period. So, <clears throat> and again, that's why there's no magical time formula for that. So let's say again, same thing. Let's say I sell my investment in Temecula and I go, ah, you know, I wanna, I wanna uh, buy an investment in Mammoth, okay? Cause I love to ski and I'm gonna go there a couple times a year and ski. The rest of the time it's gonna sit vacant. Okay, so I buy my investment property in Mammoth and now I've rented it out for a year and I haven't been happy with the return. And all of a sudden I decide hey, I'm gonna retire early and I'm gonna go live in, live in Mammoth. So now it's, uh, it's been 14 months that I've tried to rent it out, didn't work out well. I'm gonna go ahead and move into that property and I'm gonna start living there in Mammoth. Have I disqualified my exchange? No, not really. I haven't yet. But let's say now year two or year two and a half, I don't like it. I hate living in Mammoth. I don't like the weather. I don't like the snow, whatever it is. And I want to sell that property now. It's now year three. 
and I can't do an exchange because I'm living there and I can't claim it as my primary residence because I haven't held it for five years. And I'm going to pay the tax that I deferred from the previous Temecula property. So if you're going to do that conversion and convert from your investment to your personal residence, I tell people, this is Anthony Alosi logic. This is not IRS logic, okay? Where there is no logic with IRS, but Anthony Alosi logic. It's sell your investment, buy your new property, hold it for investment for three years. Then at the end of year three, you can move into it, live there, live there years four and five. Now you've met both requirements. I've held it for five years total, and I've lived in there for two of the last five years. I can claim it as my primary residence. That's That to me is a logical scenario. People go, so you're telling me I have to live there for, I have to run it up for three years. I'm not telling you that. I'm just telling you that would be my best case scenario. Okay. You could, you could rent it out for six months and move into there at month seven. If you live there for the next 15 years, no big deal. Right. Because remember the next time you trigger a taxable event would be when you sold the property. So if you sold it 15 years later, then nobody cares about your exchange. You can take your 500,000. And if there's more than $500,000 of gain, you pay the tax at that point. Okay, quick question. What if you sell at five years instead of 10? Is it less than 500,000? I was told it was 250,000. Well, no, I don't think, no, the 250, 500 is either single person or married couple filing jointly. That's the distinction between that. So at the end of year five, I don't, you, you, you don't, you're, if you're living there and you're calling your primary residence, unless things change, you're never gonna get more than a $500,000 exclusion. If, if you're a married couple. If you're a single person, you're never going to get more than 250. It doesn't matter how many years you've held the property. Is that, is that good? Yes, okay. thank you. Okay, okay. so we, we've talked about this one a lot already. This is the 121 exclusion, your primary residence. You have to live in the property any two of the last five years. Single person can exclude 250, 500, or an married couple, $500,000. And you can do this multiple times, right? You know, um, there's no limitation on how many times you can exclude $500,000 of gain. The only limitation is that you can do it every, every couple of years. So if you find the right property and the right location and timing is in your favor, then you can always exclude up to $500,000 of gain on your personal residence. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about like kind property, but that's kind of the catchphrase for 1031. Again, now I'll go back um, what is that, 40 years to the 80s when I was a kid, when 1031s were really uh, very popular, but they were done kind of differently where it had to be like for like. I don't know if anybody was doing real estate back then, but, and some people still, you know, have that understanding that, oh, it's got to be like for like. I've got to exchange, you know, a commercial for a commercial or a single family for a single family. It's not the case anymore. It hasn't been since 1991. Okay. Exchanges are investment for investment. If I sell a single family home, I can buy raw land. Someone asked that question. If I sell an apartment building, I can buy retail. If I sell office, I can buy a warehouse. So again, it's anything for anything, as long as it's real estate and as long as I hold it for investment. So the spectrum for 1031 properties is huge. It's anything that really you don't occupy as your primary residence. I can exchange a single family residence. I can exchange a duplex. I can exchange a fourplex, an apartment building office, retail, industrial, doesn't matter, right? So in my world for 1031, now again, I know our audience is generally residential, but in my world for exchange, I mean, we have residential all the way up to, you know, I, I did a transaction a year ago for a billion and a half dollars of an office building in Manhattan. So the spectrum for 1031 properties is enormous. Many, many different people, clients, um, investors out there doing transactions. And anybody that owns real estate can do an exchange. I always say, you know, Joe Smith, Joe and Mary Smith, Joe and Mary Smith, trustee of the Smith Family Trust, the Smith Irrevocable Trust, Smith LLC, Smith Partnership, Smith, it doesn't matter, right? If you, any entity that holds title to real estate can do a 1031 transaction. The only little catch is that if Joe and Mary Smith own the relinquished property, then Joe and Mary Smith have to buy the replacement property. If the Smith Corp owns the replace the relinquished property, then the Smith Corp has to be the buyer of the replacement property. You want to, at, 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 if at all possible, keep your vesting consistent. But at the end of the day, the same taxpayer that sells has to be the same taxpayer that buys. So we definitely see people coming in and out of different property types all the time. No problem whatsoever. 
people go, oh, you know what? I don't like to manage the residential properties anymore. I want to get into a single tenant property. I want to get into an, a medical office building. I want to get into, you know, something in the retail world. Great. No problem. So different property types in different states. Totally fine. Do we have I just want Yes, I just want to point out, you did answer it though, so I just want to go ahead and confirm um, that you can exchange single family home for a fourplex or commercial type, which is what you said. So anything yep. can work as long as it is in, for investment purpose. That's right. Pre held for productive use in a trade or business or held for investment. And those can be you know, intertwined, if you will. So we talk about held for productive use in a trade or business. We were talking about a guy that owns a warehouse, right? We're talking about a guy that owns a retail property. And he, you know, or he owns a, a shopping center. Though that's held for productive use, owner users, that kind of thing. So um, guy that owns a triple net, like a Jack in the Box or Starbucks, those all qualify for 1031 transactions. Okay. okay. So we've touched on this a little bit. Did I is can you see the whole slide there, Marissa? Yes. It look I believe so. Unless there's oh, yeah. more at the bottom. Okay, there is yeah, see that's weird. Okay. Oh, well, okay, how uh, I'm cutting a little bit off, but I'm not sure why it does do that. Okay, so anyway, we, we've talked about it. It's really more of just for illustration purposes. So you guys can see, you know, what what they're, what a, a typical investor looks at when they look at their property for sale. So they bought a property for hundred grand. We don't know what kind of property it is, it doesn't really matter. But now they're selling it for $800,000. So they have $700,000 of gain. If they hit all the maximums, okay, which again, most people in the exchange world do, Right? Most people that are doing 1031 transactions are you know, people that generally have higher net worth, right? They've got investment property. So most of them hit the, exam, uh, the maximum thresholds. But if they sell that property and don't do an exchange of their $800,000 sale, and again, we don't know how much they're gonna net out. We don't, don't know, it doesn't really matter. Because again, um, how do I say? Um, their their uh, debt to equity doesn't have any relationship or correlation to their basis and gain, okay? So if they bought a property for $100,000 and they're selling it for eight, let's say for example, last year, they refinanced the property and put a new loan on the property for 750 and pulled all the equity out. So now they're selling it for $800,000 and they're gonna net, let's say they net zero, okay? Because they gotta pay real estate commissions and closing costs. So their net is zero, okay? They have zero equity and they're gonna do a sale. Guess what? they're still gonna pay $252,000 of capital gains tax on the sale of that property, okay? So remember, their debt to equity ratio has zero correlation to their gain and basis. Does that make sense, hopefully? Um, so that's why we don't look at necessarily at how much debt they have or equity they have. When they're talking about doing a sale, it's what's your basis and what's your gain. And I'm just showing this again for illustration purposes, quarter of a million dollars plus, gets paid for capital gains tax on the sale of an $800,000 property, which is, you know, again, $800,000. It's not outside of the realm of possibility today for even a single family home that you bought for $100,000 and are selling for $800,000. So again, we see this a lot and people are, it's staggering how much capital gains tax they're looking at. That 252 doesn't even include the depreciation component as well. So this is what happens when someone sells a property as opposed to do an exchange. Um, so again, in a 1031 transaction, their gain is deferred. They have that 252 available for them to buy more replacement property and use that as part of their down payment. And that's, that's kind of, again, this is why people are super motivated to look at 1031 transactions. Questions on that, Marissa? I do have one question that popped in, kind of actually going back to what you were previously speaking on um, with types of properties. Yeah. What about boats with bathrooms? No. Yeah, it's got to be a real property. Yeah, okay. actually, it's funny. It's, it's interesting you mentioned, you mentioned that because I literally had a call the other day from someone who was asking me about buying a condo on a, on a boat. So I understand it's like a, a cruise line that is selling individual condos on that boat. And it literally just tours around the, the, the globe. And they, they, it's almost like, not, not like a timeshare because they have like ownership of this condo that's their unit. And she was asking me if it qualified for 1031. And, and I said, it probably doesn't because it's not real estate. It's gotta be real property. So a boat generally doesn't work. Okay. And then we do have a couple, and you may be getting to this in just a moment. We have a couple questions regarding um, 
the time period. So I think you're about to jump into that. Is that correct? That's right. Here we are. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So this is the nitty gritty now for an exchange, right? This is where things get a little bit more challenging, especially today. And unfortunately, like I said earlier, there's no COVID relief or extension that's allowable anymore. It's long gone, expired in, in, in July this, uh, this summer. So we are now, I want to say stuck with, but now we are using, uh, still using the 45 and 180 days period for an exchange. Okay. The maximum life of an exchange is never going to be more than 180 calendar days. Never under any circumstance. And actually, if your 180th day falls on a Saturday or a Sunday or a holiday, you're going to lose a couple of days and have to close on the previous business day. So remember, the maximum life of a 1031 is 180 calendar days. The trigger date is the day you close escrow. If you close escrow yesterday, today is day one. You've got 180 days to acquire your replacement property. And generally speaking, most people can acquire the new property within 180 days. That's roughly six months. The challenge is of those 180 days, the first 45 days is the identification period. And you have to identify the replacement property within the first 45 days. Again, no exceptions. There are no extensions, there are no amendments, no adjustments. After day 45, whatever you've submitted for identification is set in stone. And that's the real trigger or the real challenge of a 1031 transaction, especially today with the availability of property, access to viewing them, getting your inspector out there, getting your loan approval, whatever it is, it needs to all, you know, you need to all satisfy as much as you can within the first 45 days. Because at day 45, while you don't have to have the property under contract, you don't have to have it in escrow, you don't have to have a deposit down on it, you have to be able to acquire it before the end of the 180th day. So in today's world, I don't have to tell you any more properties are flying off the shelf, right? A day, two days, four days, a week, and they're gone. So all the better to get your properties identified sooner than later. And you can identify property and be under contract in an escrow even before you close your relinquished property. So in a perfect world, <coughs> excuse me, you close the relinquished property today and you close your replacement property early next week and you're done. Okay. And we're going to talk about the identification requirements as well and how you identify property. Okay. We do have a couple of timeframe questions, if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So speaking of the 45 um, day period, if you ID three properties at day 45 and change your mind, can you ask for your money to be withdrawn immediately? No. No. I mean, if you identify, if you identify property, it's a, it's a good question. It's a good question. If you identify it, okay, so your exchange closed yesterday, I've got the money today. The minimum amount of time I need to hold your funds, 45 days. If you don't identify anything at day 45, I can send your money back to you at day 46, okay? You have a failed exchange. If you're subject to withholding, we do the withholding and we send you the balance and then you pay your capital gains tax when you file your 2020 return. If you submit identification and at day 52 or 102 or 152, decide I'm not going to buy anything. I would change my mind. We have to hold your funds to the end of the 180th day. No question. Unfortunately, not a first American requirement. It's an IRS requirement. So okay. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that person asked because we get too many calls from people about, I want my money back. I decided not to pursue the exchange. And this is a very specific provision within the IRS code, so much so that we actually put it in our agreement and the exchanger has to initial off that they understand that the funds are not liquid for them. They're not available for them to go, hey, Anthony, I'm, I want to cancel my exchange. Can you send me my money back? So they can have it back at day 46 and that's it. Okay. Yeah. Um, also, uh, just to clarify, you said there's no extension for any reason of the time frame. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we've seen extensions granted for like federally declared disaster. Okay. So actually this year, the president issued a federal disaster for certain counties in Northern California because of the wildfires, but you have to be directly affected by it, either live there or have the property located there. So you know, I always tell people, look, I mean, unless you're praying for a hurricane, there's not going to be any extension to the 180. Okay. What if the property you're buying has some kind of big problem and you switch your purchase to a different property? Would you still have to do that before the 45th day? Well, for sure. Yeah. I mean, unless you identified, you know, if you identified just one property, 
uh, and you can't switch anyway after day 45. So if you've identified, you know, using one of the three methods, the three property 200%, hopefully you've identified something else that you can, that you can actually switch to. So that kind of goes back to what I said earlier. It's like all the better that you do as much of your due diligence as possible within the 45 day window or before that, because you don't want to be a day 52 going, Oh, we just found a crack in the foundation. Oh, we just found mold. Oh, we just found whatever. Now you have no, you have very limited options. You, there's no argument that you could say that would the IRS would say, okay, Joe, well, we understand. Go ahead and swap out your property. None. So, you know, and that, and, and really, you know, <laughs> so that that's kind of the catch for the exchange. And that's why, you know, after 25 years, people go, you know, Anthony, I really don't understand the logic of the three property rule. Why do they have that there? What is the 45 day? Where did that come from? I go, okay, there's no logic whatsoever. It's, it's simply there to make it hard. That's what, that's the only reason it's there. The IRS would much rather you pay capital gains tax. So if, the, if you want to defer the gain, you've got to fit into a tiny little window, right? And squeeze through it and make sure that you dot all the I's and cross all the T's. That's the only way that's going to work. So, yeah. Okay. Um, and let me know if you want to address this question now or later, but can they borrow against those IRS held funds? What do you, what do you mean by that? IRS held funds? I will see if they respond. If you want to give us some more context, we can answer that question. Yeah. Um, and one more question on identifying the property. Um, what's involved in identifying the property? What kind of proof? Yeah, I'm going to get to that. I think I, I, I noticed that my slides are out of order, but that's okay. Um, so here, here's our time frame for an exchange, right? So I'm going to just zip through this one real quick. Day zero is the day you close the relinquished property. Day one is obviously the next day. Day 45 is when your identification is due. And day 180 is when you have to have all your replacement properties acquired. Now, it, I'm, it's actually interesting that we're in this in this time right now, because if I close my transaction yesterday, let's say what was yesterday, the 11th, I close my transaction on November 11th. If I move forward on the calendar 180 days, I, it's going to put me past April 15th, which is my tax filing deadline. So it says it's it's 180 days or your tax filing deadline, whichever comes sooner. That's when you have to have your exchange complete. Now, in order for the exchanger to get all 180 days, they have to file an extension on their tax return. Okay, just as simple as that. They file an extension and they get all their 180 days. They're not going to get more than 180 days. They will get until I think it's October 15th to file their tax return, but they only get 180 days to complete their exchange. So someone who closes at the end of October through the end of the year, they generally need to file an exchange, uh, an, uh, an extension on their return. Otherwise, their exchange just needs to be complete before April 15th. Okay, so just again, take note of that, especially to people that are closing now in, the, in this time frame. Um, <clears throat> And again, no extensions, even if the deadline is Saturday, Sunday, or a holiday. It, we, what do we have? Labor Day a couple couple of weeks or a month and a half ago. Um, you don't get the extra day to close your transaction. You have to close on the previous Friday. In order to close, escrow needs to close. And escrow can't close on a Saturday or a Sunday or a holiday. Okay. So the identification requirements. Um, shoot, I'm sorry. My slider got a little out of order here. So in order to qualify for, for the identification, number one has to be in writing, okay? They can't send me a voicemail. They can't send me an email unless they, well, they can send me an email, but they have to scan the form in because you actually have to write out the identification. You have to describe the property, you know, right? It, you can't just say, uh, it's, it's the Brown House on Main Street. It, I, it's gotta have physical address. It's gotta have a lot in track, legal description, APN. Um, if you're buying a condo, it has to have the specific unit number. Um, so it's got to be unambiguous. The form has to be signed by the exchanger. Um, can they use any form they want? Sure. We provide a form. They don't have to use our form. They want to just write it out on a piece of paper and both sign it. Here are the properties we're identifying. No problem. They can do that. And it has to be sent before midnight of the 45th day. Not received, sent, right? Because I don't work Saturdays at you know 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So as long as they send it to me, if their 45th day is on a Saturday or a Sunday, as long as they can uh, confirm that it was sent before midnight, then I can receive it in my inbox Monday morning when I get to work, okay? And then they can revoke the identification with only within the 45 day window. So I tell people, just forget about revocation. Don't send me your list at day 10 
and then revoke it at day 15 and resend me something at day 20 and revoke that at day 35. Send me your list on day 45. That way you know that it's set in stone and can't be changed. Okay. Um, okay, so the methods for identification, I mean, there are three rules. I'm gonna go back up. Three property rule, 200% rule, 95% exception. I, I'm, I'm not you know, being facetious there. I've seen the 95% rule work one time. So it's not really a method for identification. So I don't even discuss the parameters of it. Unless you really are eager to learn about it, you can call me directly. But the most commonly used rule is the three property rule. The three property rule says I can identify three properties, any three properties without regard to fair market value, okay? So again, if I sell a million dollar property, I can identify my first property at 1.2, my second property at 5 million, my third property at 55 million. I'm not limited to the value, I'm only limited to the number. The number is three, okay? So the 200% rule is the kind of opposite of that. The 200% rule says, I can identify as many as I want. I'm not limited to three, but I'm limited to an aggregate fair market value. And that is 200% of the property I sold, okay? Sell a million dollar property, I can identify $2 million of replacement property. That can be 20 properties. If they're all $100,000 each, great, right? The aggregate can't exceed more than 200% of what I sold. So generally, generally, people are doing a one-for-one -one exchange. Most people are selling one and they're buying one. They're gonna use the three property rule. Some people are doing like a diversification exchange where they're going, you know what? I'm gonna get rid of this one property that I, that I just sold for a million five. It was a rental property that I owned and I'm gonna go buy six or seven or 10 properties in, I don't know, Nevada or Arizona or Texas or Florida, wherever, wherever you can get properties cheaper than you can get them here in California. Uh, and that's why they use the 200% rule. So if I sold a million five, I can identify up to $3 million of real, of real estate, okay? So their strategy is gonna dictate what property rule they use, okay? They're either gonna use the three property rule or the 200% rule. Okay, any questions on identification? Oh gosh, it's after 12, right? Uh, am I, we okay on time? I can't see yes. anybody's asleep out there. So hopefully they're- I know, I can't either. Yeah, we do obviously want to be respectful as time, but I'll let you continue your presentation and we'll save the last final questions if that's okay towards yeah. the end. We're, we're almost done, we're almost done. Any questions on identification there, Marissa? The only one I had, um, which you did kind of cover, um, if you identify a property within the 45 days, but then for whatever reason it falls through, what then? Yeah, I mean, if you're within the 45 days, then you can, you know, obviously revoke it and identify something else. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see, I have one more question coming through. What are the disadvantages of working with a seller or a buyer performing a 1031, especially if you are representing the opposite party? Again, no, you can either zero or later. Yeah, there are zero disadvantages, honestly, because there is no requirement for the non-exchanging party to participate, cooperate, no, nothing, right? They have to simply acknowledge that their the, the party is doing an exchange. So, you know, again, generally as a buyer for an exchange, they're the best buyers to have because they have money sitting in the exchange account and they're super motivated to close because the clock's ticking for them. On the sales side, I mean, the only disadvantage may be if the seller wants some um, additional time because he hasn't found his replacement property yet, but, but there is no requirement for the non-exchanging party to participate or cooperate. And that, that always kind of leads into questions as well too. When I talk, talk to people about, you know, putting the clause in their contract that says, you know, oh, seller must participate with buyer's exchange or buyer must cooperate with seller's exchange. I, I say remove all those terms at, whatsoever. Seller reserves the right to affect a 1031 exchange at no cost or delay to, delay to buyer. Simple, nothing, you're asking them to do nothing, right? So on the non-exchanging party does not have to be involved at any point whatsoever. They have to sign our document and, and it's really all they're doing is signing that they received a copy of it. They're not approving it, they're not accepting it. They're not doing anything other than saying, yeah, I got a copy, I received a copy of it, that was it. Thank you. Oh, okay. yeah. 
Okay, so we, we talked about this earlier, actually. This is kind of just a little nuance here within 1031 exchanges, and that's the same taxpayer requirement, okay? The same taxpayer that sells the relinquished has to be the same taxpayer that buys the replacement property. And, you know, again, we see many different, you know, investors, quote unquote, out there that are doing exchanges, partnerships, individuals, <clears throat> trust, either revocable trust or irrevocable trust. They can all do an exchange. Um, generally speaking, the vesting should be somewhat consistent or somewhat the same. It doesn't have to be because we can see something like um, if Tom and Mary Jones uh, sell the property, they can form an LLC, a limited liability company to buy the replacement property. As long as Tom and Mary Jones are the sole member of it, then it's fine because it doesn't change who the taxpayer is. The taxpayer for Tom and Mary Jones is either generally going to be Tom his social security number will be kind of the, the tax ID number for that transaction, could be Mary's. Um, but if they form a single member LLC, the new LLC does not get its own tax ID number. So that's okay. Also, we see this a lot with residential transactions where Tom and Mary Jones own the relinquished property in their family trust or their revocable trust. And the lender says, oh, we don't want to loan to their trust. We'd rather loan to Tom and Mary Jones, husband and wife. No problem, totally fine. So the vesting isn't gonna be exact, but the taxpayer is still the same. Okay. So yeah, when we talked about disregarded uh, entities for, for tax purposes. Um, okay, so just this is, I think this is my last slide here. Oh, no, I, I got my, my shameless plug coming up here for First American. Um, we, we've talked about a lot of these things here actually on, on the traps for the unwary here. So be careful about you know, exchange companies and who you're, who you're picking to do your exchange. Um, who can act as a qualified intermediary? I mean, really anybody can, um, unless they're acting also as an agent for the taxpayer. So there are attorneys that do 1031, there are CPAs that do them, there are real estate you know, agents or brokers that do them, but they can't also do or act as the client's agent as well. Um, protection of exchange. Uh, how are these exchanges protected? Fidelity bonds, error and emissions bonds. Sure, those are all great. But at the end of the day, what asset is backing the funds? Because remember, between the time the relinquished property closes until they buy the replacement property, the exchange company holds the funds, right? And for us, we provide a written guarantee that the funds are protected by First American. Documenting the exchange also is very important. And that's where we come in. Our role really is to facilitate the exchange by helping the client um, prepare the necessary documents to be compliant with state and federal regulations. And we also, again, provide that safe harbor of the funds. So you want to make sure that you're dealing with a company that has experience, that has been doing exchanges for a long time and, and, and you know, can, can accommodate that transaction. Um, and, and that's how I differ. So I'm, I, I know I'm running way late here, so I'm going to skip ahead. If you have questions on these, you can obviously email me directly. But, you know, not all exchange companies are created equal. I mean, I'm going to end here with this slide here, but it's the most important one, because when I look at the exchange industry, People don't realize it's totally unregulated. Totally. There are no restrictions whatsoever to being in the exchange world. And First American is part of a highly regulated, you know, yearly audited title insurance company. So our big brother is constantly making sure that we are, you know, up to snuff on regulations, our documents meet all the requirements, that we're doing everything above board, that we're dotting all of our I's and crossing all of our T's. We have that to, to adhere to in terms of how we operate and run our exchange business. People love to talk about, and when I say people, other exchange companies love to talk about fidelity bond. Oh, we've got a fidelity bond of 50 million. Oh, we've got an air and emissions bond of 20 million. Okay, great. It means nothing. Because let's say you're dealing with Joe's exchange company, an independent guy, and Joe charged you 500 bucks for your exchange because Anthony was at a thousand. Oh my God, you know, a thousand bucks. Well, Joe's going to charge me 500. Well, let's say Joe decides, hey, I'm, I'm taking off. I'm going to go to Jamaica. I'm going to take your money because we've seen it happen countless times where exchange companies have literally run off of the funds. Joe takes off your money and he's gone. He's got $100 million and he's never going to be found again. Okay, your clock is ticking, right? You've got less than 180 days to complete your acquisition of your replacement property. The company that has this, error, this fidelity bond, do you think you're going to get your money back within the six-month period? No way. Never. Never going to happen. So it's really a piece of paper that says, well, yeah, maybe at some point when the insurance settles, you'll get 10 cents back in your dollar six years from now. And that's what we still happen when, I don't know if anybody remembers Land America, title company, but Land America, 
um, had a exchange division. And in 2008, again, unfortunately, unbeknownst to them, two weeks before the market crashed, they invested a half a billion dollars of their exchange money in the stock market. They were trying to maximize the yield for them, right? And the market crashed and they lost everything. They filed for bankruptcy. So six, seven years later, I heard some of the people that had active transactions got 10 cents back on their dollar. They all ended up paying capital gains tax on their failed exchange because they didn't meet the 180 day requirement, the 180 day deadline. So to me, fidelity bond means zero. We have one, we have an air emissions bond, but First American issues a closing protection letter that says the title insurance company is gonna back 100% of the deposit of the exchange funds. Doesn't matter if it's 100,000 or 100 million. There's no limit on how much we can uh, guarantee on the fund. So we open separate segregated interest earning bank accounts under their tax ID number, the client's ID number. So they earn the interest, we just take a flat fee. And if it's a million dollars or less, it's a thousand dollars. If it's a million dollars or more, it's 1500 bucks. I don't wanna say the fee is a no brainer, but in the scope of what they're doing, it's kind of a no brainer. You know what I mean? I have maybe one true competitor out there. Um, most of the other guys are independent and I don't badmouth any of them because like in San Diego, I know Bill Exeter, I've known him for 20 years. Great guy, has been doing exchanges for a long time. I don't compete with Bill, right? Bill charges less than me, but he doesn't have the same strength I have. I've heard of uh, exchange resources, small independent company. I've never heard them, anything bad about them, but they don't, they don't have the same financial strength that I have. There's Safe Harbor Exchange here in Orange County. There's lots of exchange companies out there. They're just not all created equal. So when you're looking at a company, I try to encourage people to not necessarily shop for the low price guy. The low price guy is at 800, maybe 850. I'm at a thousand. The $150 difference is the strength and safety and security of First American. So there's my, my shameless plug for First American Exchange. And that's why I would encourage people to look at us as opposed to, you know, look at other people as well, too. Uh, I don't want to spend your money, but you're paying for the, you're, you're paying more, you're getting more. I do want to jump. Oh, can I just jump in for a last um, a couple questions? Just one sure. that we mentioned earlier, I got more context on. So I just want to take a moment. Um, in regards to the question, can they borrow against those IRS held funds? Um, he was talking about if um, if they cannot withdraw after 45 days. Does that help? Um, well, they're not IRS held funds. I mean, we hold the funds. So, so okay, maybe I, I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna guess here. If if they identified property and now it's day 52 and we're holding a million dollars, and they don't want to pursue their exchange, but uh, and because I, I have to hold it now until the 180 day. No, they can't borrow, pledge. They can't do anything with those funds. The funds are held in the exchange account until day 181. They're, they're guaranteed by First American and they're earning interest on the money, but they can't touch them. They can't pledge them. They can't borrow against them. None of that, unfortunately. Okay. So and also you know, all, I was going to say all, all the more reason. Sorry, Marissa, to cut you off, but they've got to make a decision, right? A, do I want to do an exchange before it closes? I have to decide to set up my exchange. And then be at day 45, do I want to move forward by identifying property or do I want to cancel out and, and close my chain? The only, the only, I'll just put a finer point on the 45 day decision. It's all or nothing, <coughs> excuse me. At day 45, they can't say, well, I'm only gonna now exchange 500,000 of the million dollars. So keep 500 in and send me a check for 500,000. We can't do that either. It's all or nothing. Okay, and I'll go ahead and prompt everyone that um, if you did have a question that didn't get answered throughout this webinar, um, Jared did include Anthony's information, which I'm sure will be on your last slide as well. Um, they can go ahead and contact you after this webinar with any yeah. final questions. You bet, for sure. Always happy to help. I mean, my day is literally spent on the phone. You know, I don't say counseling or coaching or consulting with people on their exchange transaction because. Half the people that I talk to have never done one before. So we know we need to, you know, kind of guide them through the process. And I've got a team of people here that that's all they do is spend time talking to the customer on the phone. Really for us, I mean, we provide customer service. I mean, no one's coming to me for our documentation. They're coming to me because they like the service and they feel they like the security of First American. That's why we, we, we can achieve them as business that we achieve.
I can I can attest to that. Thank you, Anthony. We've enjoyed working with you. So thank yeah, you so absolutely. much for being here today. Oh, it's been my pleasure. And yeah. Every time I have this uh, the class with you, I learn something more. Yeah. <laughs> Each time. Yeah. So. Well, I, I, I yeah, I'm, I'm curious to the feedback here. I I, I don't want to overrate myself, but I'm much better in person than I am on a Zoom call. So <laughs> hopefully it was informative and people were able to get something out of it. You're welcome to share the PowerPoint if you guys want to. I'm I'm fine with that. I, I did see some questions pop up about that. So if you have any questions, please, I, I'm a phone call away or an email away. Awesome. Totally appreciate it. Well, in the sake of time, um, I hate to rush through, but we do have a quick little heritage plug. Um, so we just want to say thank you for those of us who are currently working with us. And for those that have not um, given heritage a try, we really do look forward to working with you. Please reach out to your local representative and uh, we just want to let you know, you know, Heritage Escrow has been around for 50 years. So I think it's safe to say we're probably not going to be going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and, you know, we hire nothing but the best. Our officers are well experienced. And I think that goes a long way. Uh, we also have the latest and greatest in securities. And we just came up with the new secure portal. And honestly, it's, it's awesome. Um, and so between that and having and being backed by one of the nation's top Fortune 500 companies, I think it's a no brainer. I'm proud to say that, you know, we work with the best. And uh, with that said, for you, it means your clients are well protected. And especially against things like wire fraud and, and folks, it does happen. It's out there. And there are escrow companies that lose their entire business over something like that. So. Good news is um, same, same with us, Samara. Right? Yeah, same same with us as well too. We see it's rampant in in our business as well. Rampant. For, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I don't think people really realize that it actually does happen. This isn't some... happens all the time. Yeah, they're getting so crafty. It's it's scary how it's scary. how yeah. yeah yeah it really really is and um, that's something I'm super proud of here at Heritage Escrow is that um, you know we do have the top of the top when it comes to security. So we're very proud of that. So we would love to work with you guys. Would love an opportunity to meet with you and earn your business. That's what it's about. We want to help develop your business. So thank you for joining us today. I do want to do a quick raffle, and we have a name already picked, and it's Deborah Tom Thomas. Deborah Thomas. Yay, Deborah! Thank you. I will make sure to deliver that to you um, this week and get in touch with you after the webinar. So this concludes it, ladies. Is there anything we want to mention before we say goodbye? Thank you guys so much, Marissa. Thank you for tackling all those questions throughout um, yes. and moderating. Um, Anthony, thank you so much for your time and thank all of our clients. We look forward to seeing you or at least FaceTiming or something with you soon. Yes, and don't forget next month we'll have another one of our series and we'll have a great guest speaker next month. So we hope to see you guys soon. Thank you everyone. Thank, thank you, you guys. Bye, thank you. Bye, have a great day.